Welcome everyone. Good afternoon. Thanks for being here for today's program, Fact, Opinion, or Misinformation. My name is Lauren Williams, one of the Adult and Community Services Managers at the Columbia Public Library. And we are very glad to be co-hosting this program with the League of Women Voters of Columbia Boone County. The library and the league share a mission to support a, an educated and engaged community. And today's program will teach us nonpartisan skills so we can think more critically about our news sources and have tools for identifying fact-based information, particularly on social media. Just a couple of Zoom housekeeping items before we get started. Um, if you hover over your Zoom window with your mouse, you should see the chat icon, which looks like a speech bubble and other tools. Um, and this is typically at the bottom. Sometimes it's at the top of your screen, depending on what device you're on. If you're on a um, iPad um, or a phone, you have to tap in the middle of your screen to see those tools. But click on that chat icon to ask a question of our presenter. And you can ask a question at any time. And I'll be moderating those questions. Um, and we should also have some time for additional Q&A at the end. We are recording today's presentation, so it will be available in the next day or two on both the League's YouTube channel and the Library's YouTube channel for future viewing. Our presenter today is Seth Smith, public services librarian and friend of the facts, and I'll turn it over to you, Seth. Hey, thanks so much, Lauren. Um, it's really great to be here today. Uh, it's, it's a really um, unusually warm December day, so thanks for for coming to, to join us. Um, so before I, I get started, I, I wanted to give you some background on this news literacy initiative. In the spring of 2019, we attended a symposium on news literacy called Friend of the Facts at the University of Missouri <coughs> Reynolds School of Journalism. Fast forward to May of 2020, and the Daniel Boone Regional Library System received a grant from the Institute of Museum and Library Services <coughs> and the Missouri State Library to initiate a year-long project helping spread news literacy throughout our two-county system. And so there are two resource partners in this grant. One is named IREX, which is an acronym for the International Research and Exchanges Board based out of Washington, DC, as well as the Reynolds Journalism Institute from the University of Missouri. Um, IREX is a provider of media literacy curriculums worldwide through its Learn to Discern educational initiatives, and they've been a huge help uh, with this grant, um, as well as uh, uh, I want to give a shout out to Kathy Kiley at the Reynolds Journalism Institute. She's also been instrumental in, in getting, um, getting a news literacy project here at, at DBRL started. And so the Reynolds Journalism Institute is, is actually providing guidance through its wide network of journalists and scholars working on current news literacy projects throughout the nation. I also wanted to mention, um, I don't think we, we put it in the description for, for this program, but we are offering uh, two free books for everyone who attends this program. Um, <clears throat> so the first, and this is through the grant, um, it's, it's, all, it's all grant funded. Uh, the first is True or False, a CIA, a CIA Analyst Guide to Spotting Fake News. Um, published in 2020. I was just rereading some of it today. Um, incredibly current, very, uh, very up to date, um, and, and some really great information about misinformation and um, false news that is, is currently um, happening throughout, throughout the world right now. Um, and also it has a really interesting historical take on, on um, misinformation as well in the beginning of the book. The other one is called Keep Calm and Log On, Your Handbook for Surviving the Digital Revolution um, by Jillian Andrews. This is also very current. It's 2020. Um, there's a lot of really good information in here about both news literacy as well as um, some really great information about um, dealing with the, the digital world when we're all completely overwhelmed with it um, at times. And I know um, I can speak for myself um, um, it can be a, a, an overwhelming place place to be. So these are both uh, free books. And um, at, at the end, I'll, I'll show you my email address. You can let me know by email if, if you'd like one of these copies, uh, one copy for each participant. Um, and you can tell me which one you would like as well. So um, we're pretty excited that we can offer this. So I also wanted to mention um, and what we're trying to do, you know, I think 
so many of us now get our news from social media, and I know I'm one, I'm one of them. Um, we, we aren't trying to tell you how or where to get your news in, the, in this presentation. We're trying to point to some of the pitfalls um, that using social media can present as your, as your news source. Um, we know it's here to stay, um, and it's a huge part of daily life, especially with, in the COVID era. Um, what we really have to, we're trying to do is empower you and give you the tools on how to process media and news information. And these tools are the following. So number one, the ability to distinguish between news and reported facts and misinformation or incorrect information and disinformation, which is information designed to mislead or create harm toward a person, group, or institution. Two, uh, to have emotional resilience, to recognize when a headline or story is meant to be emotionally manipulative, manipulative or, and as well as feel confident in your skills to evaluate online articles and stories before you share them with others. And three, to use the tools and practices that make you better and more confident media consumers. So what I'm gonna do is um, share a, a little presentation that um, describes some of these techniques and you can always uh, feel free to send a chat in during any of this, this presentation. Um, I or myself or Lauren will, will answer your, your question. And so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen right now and get started on the presentation. So information consumption in the US. Kindergartens are exposed to 70 media messages every day. Adults spend 11 hours per day interacting with media. And teenagers spend at least nine hours per day with media. And I can tell you that this is true with an 11 and 15 year old at home, um, especially since they're doing so much of their schoolwork online as well. We live in a media saturated world where media and information consumption is not only a habit for most people, it's almost impossible to avoid. Most of us spend a great deal of our waking hours staring at screens, whether that be through work, school, or in the case of the COVID area, using Zoom or other digital network platforms at home. The, the statistics are overwhelming. TikTok is downloaded more than any other app we send nearly 13 million texts per day. We watch over 4 million videos on YouTube and generate more than 4 million likes on Facebook. 90% of the data in the world today has been created in the last two years alone. And our current output of data is roughly 2.5 quintillion bytes a day. And that is growing exponentially um, as more of the world gains internet access um, and the digital divide is, is lessened a little bit. So digital and social media are now our major footprint of our life. Um, the Internet Society is a really interesting organization that actually offers free webinars on how to manage your digital footprint. And this is a very important consideration, especially during the COVID era, as so much of our interactions have gone online. Your footprint, your digital footprint, isn't just confined to internet searches and online banking act activity. It's indelibly linked to how you interact with others on social media and also what you post on social media, your social media news feeds. In this new statistic, 48% of adults under 30 now get their news via social media, according to the Pew Research Center study released in 2020. This is a pretty overwhelming statistic at this point, 
and it's only increased this year as most people's lives have gone entirely online. Social media is just another addition to the already saturated 24-7 news cycle that was started in the 1980s with cable channels like CNN and then perpetuated by other 24-hour news channels like MSNBC. This is just part of that 24-7 news cycle. That doesn't mean that social media isn't a great way to communicate right now. I mean, you know, who wasn't, who doesn't want to see an awesome cat photo on Instagram during the pandemic? Seriously, I, I use it, I use Instagram all the time. Um, for me, YouTube is a very common way to, to get fast and, and quick news. Um, my YouTube feed on my phone is basically set to an algorithm that shows me um, all kinds of really interesting news from Europe. We'll talk about ag algorithms a little bit later on, but it is a good way to communicate, especially during a pandemic where a lot of people are staying at home, um, don't have a lot of communication with relatives or family as it is. However, studies have shown that social media, a little bit too much social media can also make you feel bad shown that more than one out of four young U.S. adults who spend about an hour per day on social media have higher indicators of depression. Also, social media exists to sell things. And I think if we realize that, we kind of understand a little bit better how some of these things work on our news feeds. Facebook, Twitter, they are monolithic capitalist ventures. And one of the reasons that Facebook has established algorithms is that they appeal not only to the bubble that one exists in, but they also target ads based on one's buying preferences and interests. So algorithms don't only curate and narrow the scope of what we see on social media. They do the same for just about everything we do online, whether that's Googling, other types of web searches, or even our cell phone news apps as well. What your online search turns up depends on your past search history, what you've clicked on, um, your overall digital habits. Search algorithms take into account all the digital exhausts that our online activities leave behind and present us with something that they predict we will want to see. Your searches depend on your search history as well. Additionally, the advertising you see above or below your search results depends on what algorithm believes you want. And remember that search engines make money through advertising. And while reporting is generally confined to using statistics, valid information, and other resources, the media world is full of opinion pieces, propaganda, public relations, social advertising, as well as commercial advertising, which are all targeting a specific way we may feel about something. This has recently been amplified significantly in recent years through the use of social media platforms, where a combination of all these emotive ways of messaging are used. And so, if you have a pen and paper or pencil and paper hand, handy, um, it might be useful to, to reflect on some of these news sources and also a couple of different things I, I wanted to mention. Um, we, we often don't think about what kind of devices uh, we get our information from daily, whether that be uh, TV, radio, email, or smartphones. So, so think a little bit about um, where you get your information from. I know um, I'm one of those guilty parties who uh, gets much of my news from my Android phone. Um, in fact, I would say that 75% um, of, of the news uh, comes through uh, my Google News feed on my, on, my, on my phone. Also, think about 
which channels, platforms um, you obtain these information. Like I uh, said before, Google News is, is very quick and easy for me, as well as YouTube. Um, but you might actually watch more cable news. Um, I don't watch a lot of TV myself, but some people do. Um, so it really depends on uh, what your preferences are with that. And then think about how much time you actually spend on each of these things each day on average. Add them up. Um, for instance, how much time in total do you spend on television media? Um, that's one of the interesting things that, and, and I think Lauren actually had a, um, a little tidbit about something that an app that she was using. Is that correct? Sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm an Android phone user and I know that Apple users have a similar tool. Mine's called Digital Wellbeing. Um, and you can look and see how much time you've spent um, online and it's sort of shocking. I just looked at it for today and I've been at work since eight, um, but it's telling me that I have been on my phone for an hour and a half. So this morning before work, I checked Facebook, I checked Instagram, I checked the weather, you know, I spent some time on email. So it's, um, it can be really eye opening to actually do, like you said, Seth, an accounting of how much time you're spending consuming media on what different devices or, you know, um, platforms. Yeah, I mean, I, I wanted to, to mention that um, one of one of the things that I really struggled with initially when I when I got a smartphone is is understanding um, how much time I was actually using my my phone for things other than calling or or text messaging. Um, and so, you know, it, it it became apparent very, very quickly that um, that I was spending a little bit too much time on my phone. So uh, there are some apps that, that actually help with, with that as well, too. So I'm going to go ahead and show a little video um, that's going to talk a little bit more about using social media um, as your, your news source. Um, this is from an IREX sponsored, it's called Very Verified Media Literacy Series. And um, I, I think it's really encapsulates a lot of things that we've been talking about as far as um, social media and a few of the pitfalls that that are found there. So um, go ahead and start the, the video here in just a second. Seth, we're not hearing the sound. Uh, I, I I think there, we're having a little technical issue here. Let me let me try, let, me, let me restart this. Sorry. The 2018 Global Digital Report by We Are Social and Hootsuite shows that more than 4 billion people around the world use the internet. In 2017, almost 1 million people started using social media daily. For the first time, that's equivalent to more than 11 new users every second. Social media is our reality. It's where we spend a lot of time communicating with our friends, colleagues, and relatives. Moreover, social media has given each of us the power to create, distribute, and share content to thousands of users in an instant. On social media, you will find the official materials of reputable news publications that meet the standards of journalism. But you will also find content from bloggers, opinion leaders, relatives, friends, colleagues, and so-called experts who present opinions as fact. Social media content circulates without much, if any, regulation or control. What's more, 
Not all users make a habit of checking the reliability of the information they receive and share. This creates opportunities for the spread, either intentional or unintentional, of false information and misinformation. In addition, we cannot fully control what information gets into our social media feeds. The information we see is filtered by algorithms. In order to better understand user preferences, Facebook collects user data online. Based on our likes, the links we click, the locations we tag, the affiliations we have, and much more, these algorithms personalize the content we see and select the content they have identified as being most relevant for us. For example, if you are searching for a new car online, don't be surprised if your Facebook newsfeed offers you auto loans. Based on user preferences, social media platforms select the pages that might interest users most and may bypass interactions with users or pages that are affiliated with opposing groups or express differing opinions that could cause users to visit the platform less often. So, Every time we see Facebook, the content we see is affected in some way according to this system. Prior to 2018, Facebook had been buying information about offline user behavior from major marketing and analytics companies such as Axiom, Epsilon, Experian, Oracle Data Cloud, TransUnion, and WPP. Most of these companies operate globally with offices in the Americas, Europe, and Asia. There is an ongoing controversy around these issues. As a result of public pressure, in April 2018, Facebook updated its data policy, indicating that it no longer used the information received from third parties. But it did not prohibit businesses that promoted their products and services on Facebook from doing so. Instagram works in a similar way as Facebook and prioritizes the moments you care about. YouTube's stated goal is also to help viewers find the videos they want to watch. In other words, they prioritize the content in your feed using data primarily obtained from your previous activity on the site, such as your search and view histories. In contrast, Twitter's algorithms work a bit differently. Twitter structures information displayed in its feeds in chronological order and uses algorithms to simply change the order of relevance of tweets. Here is more good news for you. You can disable these algorithms in your settings. In conclusion, when using social media as a news source, be on guard for opinions, manipulative content, and other forms of algorithm-driven misinformation. You may not always be in control of the information in your feeds, but you can recognize the means by which it got there and resist the urge to share it further without examination of its source and potential biases. In the end, it's up to you to decide how you interact with the information you see online. Distinguish facts from opinions and do not share unverified content. Care before you share. Yeah, so I really like the uh, the care before your share idea. I, you know, I think I think that's a really important um, perspective to have, especially when we're we're dealing with so much inflammatory news that's that's been coming across um, every day, uh, twenty four seven um, at this at, at this juncture in, in our our uh, our nations and world's history. In, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the toolbox that um, we're, we're trying to offer with this presentation. Um, how do you actually uh, make decisions on what, what is valid, um, what to share, um, how do you check on the, um, tr the trustworthiness of particular news sources? So it's, it's, a, it's a tricky world uh, for sure uh, out there. And, and we want to help you give give you some some pointers on this. So, number one, consider the source. Click away from the story to investigate the site, its mission, and its contact information. So, 
Interestingly, one of the uh, most notorious satirical news sites is, is a, it's, it's a site called the National Report. And the book, um, this, this first book that I showed, the True or False um, book by Cindy Otis talks a little bit about some of the articles that, that have come across this satirical website um, have caused a lot, of, uh, a lot of damage, honestly. Um, this one in particular was uh, something that was claimed that uh, solar panels drain the sun's energy, experts say. Um, this is, of course, um, completely ludicrous, but it was, uh, it was shared 1,800 times on Facebook. Um, and there are many, many comments at the, at the bottom of this news article that, that actually say that, um, that, that this, is, this is true. Um, so one of the things that you need to do is follow the disclaimer or about pages. Figure out um, what what they're trying to uh, trying to say if, if it's if it is satirical. Um, in this disclaimer, it says it's it's a news and political satire web publication which may or may not use real names, often in semi-real or mostly fictitious ways. I, I was even struck by it says here if you need if you are in need of professional help, please consult a professional. <laughs> It, it, the thing is, though, it, you know, they're trying to be funny here, but these these websites have caused a lot of um, a lot of damage and a lot of confusion to people. Um, and also, um, there is the the real fact that these people set these satirical websites up and um, get involved with Google AdSense, and draw, it draws in it draws a tremendous amount of money. Um, with with because ads just pop up everywhere on, on these as well. So also read beyond headlines can be outrageous in an effort to get clicks. And so what's what's the whole story. So this is quite interesting. This is actually from a very uh, valid news source, which is CNN. Um, it says Ebola in the air, a nightmare that could happen. Basically, um, this is not something that, that can happen. Um, it's, it, in fact, it would be almost, it, it's almost impossible for this type of hemorrhagic fever, this type of virus to become airborne. However, um, it, it was a ploy to draw readers into to the, to the article. Um, and basically, you can see uh, Google AdSense just popping up on the bottom right-hand side of the screen. So the more outrageous the headline is, um, the more clicks it's going to draw and the more money these, these um, news agencies are gonna make. This isn't in particularly, um, you know, it's not incorrect. There is a, a quote from one of the epidemiologists that says um, basically something like, this is, this is an incredibly rare, um, and almost impossible that this, this would happen, but it, there is that small, minute possibility. Um, so that's misleading in in, in something in, in a, actually a very valid uh, uh, news source uh, most of the time. Clickbait. We all we're all familiar with clickbait. Um, this is an example of what it looks like. It's an example of. Um, headlines or uh, something manipulative that will get you to get you to click on it. Um, a lot of times clickbait like this does not take you to um, the, the place at all where, where you're, you know, like this, this picture of Jimmy Fallon. Um, um, I, I would guess if you, if you clicked on that, um, it would lead you to com something, a, a website that's completely different. Um, so this is viral content that um, contains a lot of misleading information. Um, it appears on very uh, uh, valid websites, especially you know if you look at the Columbia Tribune at the very bottom of, of all their web pages, you will find you will find clickbait. It's just a way for advertising um, agencies as well as newspapers to to make uh, make some money. And newspapers are are really hurting these days. So, you know, I, I think they're trying to find ways to, to generate revenue streams. 
So check the author. Do a quick search on the author. Are they credible? Um, are they a real, real author or a real person? Um, another great example of a quote unquote satirical website comes from this, um, it's a site called Taters Gonna Tate. Um, they've made themselves uh, ludicrously um, satirical in the masthead. However, they, they post a lot of very inflammatory quasi news articles that get shared um, all the time. Uh, so this one was uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez proposes a nationwide motorcycle ban. Um, this was one of the most shared fake news stories ever. It was shared 1.4 million times on Facebook. You can see that information right there. Um, the author, Fallis Gunnington, um, the tags for his under his byline are dream come true for you fan fiction as well as hot potato. So you know um, those are some real red flags there as well as the masthead that says taters gonna take. But this particular news article um, was shared uh, many, many times um, throughout the last couple of years. So another great way to check on the validity of, of news sources or articles is using either Snopes.com or PolitiFact. Um, so this article was widely disproven. Um, Snopes, they have basically a, a true false meter. Um, it, it fell completely down in, into the false, um, the falsity part. And then, then PolitiFact Politif has a very interesting, um, it has a it has another tr truth meter that basically says pants on fire if it's if it's com if it's a completely erroneous uh, news news uh, is, do we have a few chats lauren that no sorry i'm just uh, pasting in the chat um the links to these websites so people can oh, check okay. them out later if they'd like yeah, to yeah 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 okay sounds good yeah yeah so so snopes.com and politifact are um really great resources uh, for for checking on um, some of these some of these articles, factcheck.org is another one as well. Um, if you're if you're looking for the validity of a of a news article, so another thing you need to watch out for are opinion pieces. Opinion pieces are very biased, and Usually any sort of web based content or even a newspaper is, is going to clearly state that they are an opinion piece. However, a lot of people share opinion pieces as fact. Um, I know I, I have been guilty of that on, on Facebook before myself. And um, so you can see uh, this article, Saudi regime murdered my fiance, can't be allowed to buy Newcastle United is obviously an opinion piece. Um, but because of the format of social media and the move toward more, you know, extreme clickbait headlines, some people might be sharing this as, as some kind of, um, fact-based news, news story. Um, this also, you want to, um, this, this article was flagged as four months old at the top of the, of the article. So that's, um, that's also something to be aware of. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. So supporting sources, um, click on those links. Determine if the info given actually supports the story. Uh, for instance, is it, is it peer reviewed? Um, peer review is known as refereeing in some academic fields. And it's the process of subjecting an author's scholarly work or ideas to the scrutiny of others who are experts in the field. It's used primarily by editors and publishers to select and screen submitted manuscripts so that, that are worthy of publication. Um, and the peer review process is aimed at getting authors to meet standards of their discipline. Publications that have not undergone peer review are like, likely to be regarded with suspicion by scholars. Um, and this particular article right here 
was published claiming that the SARS-CoV-2 genome was probably manufactured um, and the article was spread through social media. Uh, so basically it was saying that this was a manufactured virus, um, the virus possibly leaked from a, a, a laboratory, um, and that's how the spread started. It was not published in a, in a, in a scientific journal. It was published in, in an open source journal. Um, and it was not peer-reviewed peer as well. So, um, so this, this particular article um, is not, um, if, you, if you click away and, and figure out where the, what the source is, it's, it's not um, a, a very valid scientific article. Check the date. Reposting old news stories doesn't mean they're relevant to current events. So this is an example of what the Guardian newspaper is trying to do. Um, and it's a really good initiative. So old news articles, sometimes five or 10 years old, are often reshared on Facebook or Twitter as new news. Um, so the Guardian is now flagging all on their, on their, on their online website um, is, is flagging all articles that are, I think, older than three months um, with this with this yellow tag. Uh, a lot of people, and I've I've also fallen into this trap, reposting old news stories on Facebook or other social media is is easy to do. Um, you might find something that proves your point from uh, you know ten years ago, uh, and it's 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 sometimes it's misleading. Um, because the actual article doesn't really have a date on it. Um, and that's something that's, uh, that's really prevalent in, in digital media now. Um, and that wasn't as much of a problem with, with print media. Also, is it a joke? If it's too outlandish, it might be satire. Research the site and author to be sure. So, Articles from The Onion um, are a great example of, of, of satire that has um, that is, is come, come across our, our social media feeds for years now. Um, as many of you have realized, social media um, uh, and, and satire, uh, things have gotten very, fairly blended recently. A lot of things that seem like satire aren't satire, um, and, but this is a really great example of, of something that's obviously satire. Um, SeaWorld does not keep their um, their orcas in plastic bags while they clean the tanks like you would with goldfish. It's just absurd that someone posted this and said, this is why SeaWorld needs to go. Um, this, is, this is something that happens. And it's especially prevalent with some of those other satirical sites that I showed uh, before this where it's, the line is very blurred between actual news and, and satire. Yeah, so digital alteration has also completely changed the satire landscape. Um, I mean, you can tell a little bit that the one on the right, the blurry one is, is probably the one that's, that's not legit, but these, these two um, covers um, some some satirical website actually came out saying that Time Magazine had published a How to Survive the Coming Ice Age um, back in, I believe it was 1977. Um, and this was kind of a, a ploy on disproving global warming, basically. Um, but it was a manufactured, the one on the right was, was, a, was a manufactured cover. Um, the one on the left was a real one. Um, and it deals with the, the current global warming um, crisis that, we're, we're, that is happening right now. Also, so check your biases. Consider if your own beliefs could affect your judgment. Um, so confirmation bias, it's a tendency of people have toward embracing information that supports their beliefs and rejecting information that contradicts them. Um, one, one reason why users of all ages might believe fake news 
is the natural tendency to believe information that appeals to one's emotions or personal beliefs. So I know that I am just as easily convinced that um, something is true because I live in my own filter bubble being the person that I am. And I think a lot of people kind of exist in, in their own their own bubble and aren't quite aware of it. So a really interesting, um, and this is, this is something that we'll, we'll also share on our resource page, is a, a really interesting site is called mediabiaschart.com. It examines key English language publications throughout the world and rates them according to their political orientation, their interpretation of the news, um, whether it contains propaganda or misleading information, or whether the opinion is fair or persuasive. You can actually download uh, a free PDF of this from their website. And like I said, we will um, include this um, on the research uh, resource page at the end, which I can also um, email um, to participants. Also, so the Reynolds Journalism Institute, um, which I talked about as, as one of the resource partners for this grant, um, they have a trusting journalism site. Um, and it's, it's, it's actually really, really useful. Uh, this chart was published in July of 2017. Um, so it's a little outdated, but if you go to the report itself, um, you're gonna see a lot of really interesting information about how they gathered their data and the metrics they used to, um, to, to sort these different um, news agencies by least and most trusted. Um, I think it's a really good example of good, solid research into, into media literacy, literacy. And so um, RJI is, is doing some, some really great stuff with this. So also ask, ask the experts, um, ask a librarian or consult a fact checking site. Like I talked about, um, Snopes.com is, is, a, is a great one. Um, so you know, as librarians, we really feel like we are on the front lines of assisting patrons with uh, news literacy education. Um, we, we feel like we're, we're on the front lines of, of, of upholding democracy in some ways. And, and helping people understand where they get, not only where they get their, their news um, and what's valid information out there, but supplying that news to people um, and making sure that they, uh, they, get, they get what they need. Um, all of our staff have now been tra trained in basic news literacy training, and this is through the grant. So um, a wide variety of people have, have taken um, a couple of modules um, dealing with news literacy training. And, you know, one of the things that we, we also want to mention is that we're not alone in this. Um, the Reynolds Journalism Institute and the University of Missouri School of Journalism is very involved in media liter literacy. Um, they're trying to reach out to extension officers throughout the, the state to, to work with, with this initiative. Um, and there's just a lot of really cool stuff going on. Finally, the, um, I want to mention uh, the Columbia Public Schools. Um, when I went to the Friends of the Facts uh, training, uh, I, I was introduced to a wonderful teacher um, at Battle High School, I believe, who's introduced something called iCivics to the curriculum. And this is um, basically it's training for high school students in, in dealing with um, how to you know how to handle their social media feed um, how to um, how news literacy actually works uh, so um, kudos to to her on that as well so we're we're here to help and that's um, that's something I really want to stress about um, about librarians and other educators. Seth, here's a question that we can use our librarian skills yeah. on. Um, yeah, someone's yeah. asked um, Steve asked, can we comment on the term the mainstream media? Who does that term refer to? Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting. I, I think that um, that I, I, in some ways that depends on your filter bubble. Um, I think there, you know, I want to 
refer back to um, the research that the Reynolds Journalism Institute did, um, as well as the media bias chart, um, there are particular there are particular news or organizations that are more trusted than others, and some and a lot of people see see as being uh, more neutral. A great example um, is the magazine The Economist. Um, they are known as being um, very centrist, uh, neutral on a lot of uh, a lot of different a lot of different perspectives. But um, I, I think it, I think. I, and I think that term is thrown around a lot um, as a pejorative term, but I think there's still some some good, um, you know, some really good media outlets are out there that that ten, um, do present news in an unbiased way. I, also, I think that, traditionally, yeah, yeah. It, I think that's right on. Like you said, the, the definition is shifted and it, it does get used as a pejorative. I think traditionally right. it meant it meant just more traditional um, sources of news and like the large media outlets that kind of everybody paid attention to. So, you know, NBC and ABC and um, uh, some of those uh, channels, um, I think are, people think of as um, right. the more mainstream media versus alternative presses or alternative um, news sources that may have a very particular point of view. Yeah. Exactly, and that the media bias chart is a fascinating uh, look at, at um, where uh, they, these fall on kind of the, the, the Venn diagram of biased and unbiased. Um, so it's well worth a well worth a, a look. Um, so I want to uh, talk a little bit about the um, we we use the the poster from something called um, International Association of Library Association and Institutions. Um, this is a freely available as a PDF on their website. It's also on our resource page. Um, we found it to be a really useful resource for uh, as a quick reference for staff, students, and, and patrons. Um, so check that out. Um, it's, um, it's something that, uh, that I, I think all of these pointers are Extremely valid, um, and and we uh, we have it we had it hanging in our staff area for, for a couple of years. So finally, um, I want to talk a little bit about some new technology. Uh, so one of the things we, we want to make sure people know is that uh, we're not trying to scare you. Uh, we're making it seem like uh, you know getting. It's not necessarily even bad to get your, all of your your news from social media. Things are changing so rapidly, though, that um, I think there there's a lot of opportunity for for deceit out there. One of the things that um, we've thought about is um, the the prevalence of CGI. Um, and can you believe everything you see? So the future of news and media will actually be a little bit uh, further complicated by technology like this. And I'm going to show this fascinating little uh, little video here. He's there, sir. On Scarif. The original plans for this station are kept there, are they not? Charm to the last. I will tell him that his patience with your misadventures has been rewarded with a weapon that will bring a swift end to the rebellion. I will tell him that his patience with your misadventures has been rewarded with a weapon that will bring a swift end to the rebellion. Yeah, so so this is uh some of you might know the the backstory behind this, the, the Star Wars franchise brought back the great British actor Peter Cushing um, into the fray in Rogue One using CGI. Uh, the digital replica I found hauntingly similar to the original actor. In fact, there was almost no way, he was almost indiscernible from, from the real P Peter Cushing in the original Star Wars. Um, so, you know, 
there, there is, te there's technology out there that, um, that is, is powerful. And there are also satire sites that are very misleading. And, um, you know, I, I think there's, there's what, what we're trying to do in, in with this, with this initiative is give you the tools and the toolbox to be able to, um, see, read between the lines and be able to, to, to parse some of this confusing information that's out there. I know that before I started working on media literacy, literacy myself, um, I was much less wary of, of how to navigate this, this, this somewhat tricky world. Um, so one of the things I want to do is uh, show you the res uh, select resource page. Um, like I said, uh, we, we'd be glad to send these to you. Um, I, I do want to mention that there is a survey at the end of the presentation. Um, if you want to put your, you, you'll be, we'll get your email from that. You can also um, indicate which one of these, these books you would like in the survey. I also have um, an email. Oh yeah, and again, plugs for these, these two books. Um, it's, we're really excited to be able to offer both uh, Keep Calm and Log On and True or False. Uh, and we we think that these are a great component to this to this presentation. They're they're just released this year, so um, so uh, we, we'd love to send you a, a copy. Um, yeah. So thanks for attending. Uh, my my email is up here, and um, if if you want to email me, uh, I can send you one of these these books. Um, also, like I said, there's a survey. Uh, at the at the end of the presentation, um, you can indicate on there if you if you'd like a book as well. So um, I think they're um, great books, and uh, I want to turn it over. We do have about five minutes left. If anybody has uh, any more questions, um, we'd, we'd be glad to take them. We have a it's a, a comment um, from Kathy. She says you've used the terms obviously and obvious, but I believe it's not obvious at all to far too many people on Facebook, for instance that what's posted as opinion, not fact. Um, are there any fact checking sites that um, are seen as more conservative or would be seen as nonpartisan by people who might lean conservative? Uh, she's saying, sadly, some of my family members do not trust those sites. Like they think Snopes and PolitiFact and some of those sites are are themselves right, liberal. Right. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, there, there's been there's been a, uh, a, a recent push toward um, politicizing the fact check, fact checking sites themselves, um, by some conservative groups, especially, uh, it's, it's not, um, they, they are especially, um, factcheck.org and anything that's coming from the Pointer Institute, um, tend to be, are, are completely nonpartisan. Um, Snopes.com as well, uh, and I, I think there, it's what's problematic for some people is the dot com at the end of, of Snopes. I think um, it is a for profit uh, website, so um, you know it does take advertising and things like that. Uh, one one of the things I did talk to IREX uh, at length about these fact checking sites, and you know they have worked with this curriculum and 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 these things for for over a decade now, and they they say all those three are completely trustworthy and, and nonpartisan. Um, and so uh, I don't know how you get that, you know, to disbelievers, I don't know how you quite get that across. But um, one of the things you will see on, on Snopes and fact, uh, factcheck.org is um, are, are, are lots of um, lots of articles, lots of articles from very left leaning sources that are disproven as well. Um, they're not you know, they're not just uh, disproving conservative conspiracy theories. There are lots of conspiracy theories theories from the left as well. So it's it. They tend to they. I think they're all legit. Those three in particular. Do we have other questions? All 
All right, well, I'm going to put in the chat, um, again, I wanna thank um, Seth for presenting this today. Um, very eye-opening, uh, that resources page, you know, perhaps that poster that just has the, um, the tools, lists the tools, um, that's from a, a resource that may be seen as, as neutral, that you could share that with folks who might be skeptical. Um, I wanna thank the League for co-presenting. I'm uh, putting in the chat there a link to their upcoming events. They also have some recordings of past events. Um, upcoming library events uh, can be found on the library's website as well. Um, like we said, this presentation has been recorded. So uh, if in a couple of days, it will be available on our YouTube channel. So if you have someone you really want to share it with, um, please do that. Um, and finally, uh, you know, we have a small team of librarians who have been trained um, in this information. And we would love to talk to your church groups, um, talk to your civic organizations. If you're doing online meetings or having online guest speakers, um, we can do a version of this presentation for you at any of those events. So, um, you know, please reach out to Seth and let him know and we can get those things scheduled. We can come to, to you virtually. Again, this has been wonderful. Thank you for joining us and have Thanks a great everybody. day.